Uh, Jacob Ingebrigtsen, you called it, Gordon. You said going back several months now, maybe even last year, you said Jacob could beat Timothy Chariot. He does it. He's now one for 13 all time against Chariot. This is his first <laughs> victory. Ingebrigtsen went to the front early on, got the pace going. They went through at 56, but then Chariot hopped right to the front of the train as expected. This was quick. They go through 800 in 151. A lot of other people are going up there to join Chariot, but he's still he's still pushing the pace with some quick laps. 247 through 1200. Josh Kerr puts his name into the hat there. But Ingebrigtsen was latched on. He was latched on the entire way. And with 100 to go, he makes his move, runs a 328. 328 to get gold ahead of Chariot. This race was fast from top to bottom. Everybody but Chariot in the top six got a PB. So the fastest race of Ingebrigtsen's life. And Josh Kerr almost gets past Chariot to get the bronze medal. The podium, not wholly that surprising when you look at how fast people have run this whole year and the type of race we expected. But still, when you're 0 for 13 against somebody going into an Olympic final and you get the upset, it's it's at least a little bit shocking because we just have not been used to chariot losing big races over the past couple of years. I just feel like Jacob Ingebrigtsen was, I'm not trying, I'm trying to come up with an example. He was like a, a fire hose that was just spraying at like a crack in the wall, right? And that <laughs> crack was holding away, the, was holding the water in for as long as possible. This fire hose was him coming on the scene at age 18 and 17, running fast mm-hmm. at all time age mark, making finals, doing well at Euros. And like then challenging the best at Monaco Diamond Leagues, finishing third in a bunch of races. And he constantly was throwing more and more pressure on the elites of the elites at this event. And uh, finally, the dam broke. And I think now that the dam has broken, that he is able to become victorious in the ultimate event, which is the 1500 meter final at the Olympic Games. It's just going to, like, I don't see anyone being this guy for at least, I think he can go on a run. I think he's been waiting to break through. He finally has it. Chariot cracked. And now it's going to be smooth sailing from here because, like, he's only 20 years old, right? He's not even 21. Is he 21 or is he 20? 20 years old. He's shown that he's able – he's now gone through the the gauntlet of, you know, failures and successes, big PBs, big breakthroughs. It's the sky's the limit now for him, and I think – He's going to go on a big run for his next two to three years of continuing being the gold medal favorite and most likely always achieving that gold medal because I just – I don't see Terry coming back to being able to – like, in 2022, I would give Inga Britson 75% chance of winning. All right, let's calm down a little bit. Let's calm down what? a little bit. This is mean, first win. It's first win. Well, there's other guys there too. This was a deep. This was a deep race. I agree. He's the dude. He looked like he was future. jogging across that finish line. I don't know about that. He wasn't I don't close. know about that. I think tactically, what Chariot did makes sense. And keep in mind, he's only 25 as well too. I think tactically, what Chariot was it was consistent with what he's done. But I I wonder. Basically, Jacob played this perfectly because he went out got the pace going so he so it was going to be honest which is what you want to do if you've run sub 1250 for a 5k and you're really good in diamond leagues but then chariot just he insists on leading so then chariot's doing all the work and ingerbritson's just sitting on his shoulder sitting on his shoulder until 100 meters to go i think chariot's strategy would have worked a little bit better in in the 2019 era when there was more of a gap but now we have the situation where Everybody's so much closer, so those minor things start to play in. I'm seeing this tweet here from Cathal Dennehy. Timothy Cherry confirms his coach spoke to Jacob Ingerbritson's coach slash dad ahead of the final, and plan was made to cooperate to share the pace in the 1500 meter final. Cherry said he felt his left hamstring ever since the semifinals and during the race. Okay, so they made a plan. 
which was good. Would you call that sharing the pace though? Hey, you do the first 400 and then I'll do everything up until the final 100. You do, you do zero to 400 and then I'll do 500 to 1400. Because me, was, I guess he, let's see, Jake, yeah, Jake, second, 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 second. I mean, he's right there. He's right there. He wasn't far off the pace, but Cherry there was doing the lion's share of the work. I, think, I don't blame, I I don't blame Inga Britson for doing it, but, but I don't, sharing is tough to do in a 1500. It's not a 5K where you have enough time to settle in. I guess sharing means the first lap. I think that conversation was, hey, if we make this a sub-330 race, we're guaranteed 1-2. Or we're both, not, well, maybe not 1-2, but we're both guaranteed medals. If we let someone else take over and this becomes, you know, a Sensowitz type race in 2016 where the winning time is like 340 or 335, they're not, they yeah. might not guarantee 1-2. So I think they were like, hey, you and me, we know we're better than everyone. If we make it sub-330, our odds go drastically up and then let the best man yeah. win. So let's let's make this a dual meet and not a, a you know, a 12-team final, 12, 12, 12, 12 athlete final. That's what I think. Well, it almost was. didn't. It, it almost didn't. It almost didn't work because Kerr almost got Chariot there at the end. So it almost was gold and bronze. Okay, well, if that was the, if that's the thinking, makes a tad more sense. I believe. I mean, I think it, I think you're right. I think overall, yes, it makes sense. I just don't know. Did they draw straws for who was going to do the first lap and who was going to do everything else? Because Cherry, he does seem more comfortable in front, just like the way his stride is and what he's used to running. Like he does seem more comfortable in front. So I would get, maybe he would say, Hey, it's, it's fine. I would rather be in that position. But when you look at how that race played out and Jacob was super duper strong over the last hundred, you'd think, okay, the, the better chance would have been or a different, a different chance, and maybe it would have given you only a tiny bit better shot at, at winning, and you see this in hindsight, so obviously it's impossible to predict, but if he was, if he didn't have to, to put as much pressure, because he went, what I mean, they went 56, 56 for the Open, then Chariot took over and dropped a 54, and then it went to about a 56 again, so he was not lagging in those, in those laps. It wasn't as if he took over and then slowed the thing down. It's funny. We get team tactics, and then they're between Norway and Kenya. And then in the <laughs> high jump, they're between Qatar and Italy. Those are the two greatest moments of teamwork, I think, these entire Olympics. Hey, maybe it was the pandemic. Everyone was sick of being all by themselves. It's just the way to come together. Cross-country, mm -hmm. generational coming together, young and old, you know, East Coast, West Coast, that's what we're seeing. Um, we got to talk a little bit about Josh Kerr. Dude. Yeah. Sixth, sixth in 2019. He was kind of had, you know, you were wondering if, like, if he was going to be a consistently, like, hey, he's always going to be able to make a final, but I don't know if he's ever really going to be top three caliber, right? He can, you know, always maybe one time get fourth, but he's going to be fourth to tenth you know, notoriously, and always have, like, a, a solid PB. But this was him saying, like, no, I'm not going to be complacent with just being a, a good top 12 type guy in the world. I want to be able mm -hmm. to start putting my name on the record books, have, like, a Nick, a Nick Willis-type career where you can look back and say, I have multiple medals. And I think this is a very impressive medal that he got. This was a fast race. There was no like fluky tacticals that got him to third. And he almost, he mm -hmm. almost caught Terry, which he mentioned, but I was very impressed with yeah. the massive PB. He timed his season perfectly. I remember watching, he did a, a time trial um, mm -hmm. where he negative split like a one. I, I wish I could remember the, the time he ran, but he negative split like a 150 which I thought was interesting to kind of practice how to like close hard off of a, a hard pace. And mm -hmm. yeah, look at the progression here on the screen. We'll put that up. I remember when he broke that collegiate 1500 meter record in Azusa, she's in 335 mm -hmm. to one there in 2018. And then just three years later, he's already running sub 330 and getting yeah. Olympic medals yeah. out of it. Very impressive for Josh Kerr. It's always cool. 
to see an NCA athlete like find a way to, to keep that success moving into the, the next level at the Olympic level because a lot of times dominant NCA milers or NCA distance runners in general, they kind of just plateau out, right? You kind of realize they're only as good as their surroundings. But Josh Kerr being able to go to that next step, which is the hardest step to take. It's easy to go mm-hmm. from high school to college because the training just is so much better. But to go from college to Olympic medalist is just like, it takes more than just good coaching. It takes like unique talent. And so Josh mm-hmm. Kerr to quickly go into the top three, very impressive. And I'm a big fan of Josh Kerr. And- and you had a situation where in, in Doha, he didn't get a medal, but he ran his best race there, I thought. He ran fast time. He's a big race runner, Josh Kerr. And he's one of those guys we've been watching the last couple of years. He'll, he's not afraid to push the pace. So he knew that this was the type of race that was going to play out in Tokyo, and he was completely prepared for it. And we've just had such a huge change in the 1500 over the last couple of years where you had everything was he was predictably slow and tactical and then now we're going to the just basically from the gun it's to the point they don't even need i mean they don't need rabbits it like you could have a situation where like the world record is is under threat in a, in a race as long as the track is fast and the conditions are good but just with all these guys like you put Stuart mcswain in a race he's going to go hard. You put Timothy Chariton in a race, he's going to go hard. Kurt is going to go hard. Ingebrigtsen is going to stick right there, and he's not afraid to lead. Nobody is afraid to lead in that top tier of, of milers right now in the world, and this is the result. And I think Cherry kind of started that, where he just was like, hey, I'm better than everybody, so I'm not going to play any games. I'm going to make this a 1,500. I'm not going to make it an 800 or a 1,000 or a 400. I'm just going to run an 800. And Everybody's followed his lead because that's what you've needed to do to catch up. I remember in Doha, in the post race, people were basically saying, yeah, we knew we were running for second. And that wasn't the mentality here. The mentality was, Chariot set the standard, now we need to follow. And Ingebrigtsen was in that 15 in Doha. Granted, he had run the five already as well too. So he knew that. Josh Kerr was in that race. He knew exactly what to expect. and. Yeah, what a what a what a big time performance there. Great Britain gets three into the into the final and comes away with with a medal there. Farther down on the list, I'll just well, well before you get to that, before you get Travis, can you put yeah. back up that capital yeah. quote of the Rule Forty? So uh, Capital tweeted out um, Josh Kerr was asked about um, his sponsor Brooks, and due to Rule Forty, he's not allowed to say anything. So he says, "Am I allowed to mention these guys?" He's told no. And then he says, the brand that he just said is bloody awesome. They believed in me when I was in the NCAA. I'm very proud of my decision to go with them. And that goes like, hey, man, Danny Mackey just coached uh, an Olympic bronze medalist in the 1500. Mm-hmm. That Brooks, you know, the, some people, you know, we kind of think about, like, where do you go for training? Like, everyone wants to go to a Bowerman Track Club, right, or NOP during their time when they were up. Uh, and Brooks Beast maybe – wasn't considered like the number one choice for everyone. But now Danny Mackey can sit back and be like, hey guys, if you work, if you have the talent and you work hard, I can coach you to run sub 330 and be an Olympic bronze medalist. I'm just yeah. so thrilled for Danny Mackey. It's, it's, it's wild. Um, but uh, big ups to the Brooks Beasts, getting it done. Um, I'm excited to see what they can do. I mean, they also have some other guys like Henry Wynn was running pretty well this season for mm-hmm. the U.S. Um, obviously it's hard to make that U.S. team, but uh, maybe there's a college kid out there who's now thinking, hey, maybe I, maybe well, Brooks Beast is, is, is my path because clearly it, it, it works for some people. Yeah, his success as a pro was not guaranteed. Yeah, he was an NCAA champion and he broke the collegiate record and he ran 30, 335, but we've seen people who have won titles and not necessarily run as fast as he did because he ran 335, but – who have had really good college careers and it doesn't translate in the mile. Like that's yeah. happened often. And for him, and then you saw Oliver Hoare in this final, he mixed it up too. He really put himself out there, ended up fading a bit too. For them to translate and be you know, big time pro runners is something you can't take take for granted. On that Rule 40 thing, I'm wondering like what's the most creative way, if you can't say the name, 
can you get the reporters to say the name back to you and be like, oh, that's awesome. Like if you said, hey, who's an underrated character in Shawshank Redemption? And they say, oh, Brooks. And you'd be like, yeah, that was my favorite character. That character really helped me prepare <laughs> for today. I carried it. I, you know, I just, just can't tell you how much that character was better than all the other characters. I'm wondering if there's a way uh, to get, I mean, he played that pretty well though, because he, he knew the rule, didn't want to violate the rule, but then he said it without saying their name. That was pretty, pretty well done there by Kerr. Tactically sound on the track. Yeah.